Hey, everybody. Um, this is School Psych Podcast. We're here tonight to chat a little bit about um, intellectual disability and assessment. And we've got an awesome guest who's back for episode number three. He doesn't learn his lesson. Um, <laughs> so we're excited for that. Um, but I am Rachel, and I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Maryland. I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca. Rebecca? Hi, everybody. I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist working in the state of Connecticut. And I'm really excited tonight. Of for our guests, for Dr. Farmer, and also that we are fully staffed here at Psych Podcast tonight. We have our full team, so I'm very excited about that, and I want to remind everyone how to participate. Um, there are so many ways that we would like to hear from you. If you are watching on YouTube Live, at um, watching live right now, feel free to comment right in the, um, you have to sign into your YouTube account and then you can comment right in the chat box alongside the video. I'll be looking for comments and questions there to share them with the group. And also you can comment on Twitter using the hashtag Psyched Podcast and on both Facebook pages. So on School Psyched, your school psychologist and the School Psyched Podcast page, I will be looking for notifications so you can comment anywhere you'd like in private messages or on the page directly. And now I will turn it over to Anna who's going to tell us about our poll. Hi guys, I'm Anna. I'm a school psych in upstate New York. Um, we put a little poll up on Facebook and we had hundreds of people respond. We asked, what criteria do you require for a diagnosis of ID? Check all that apply. Uh, the top vote by far was FSIQ equal to or below seven plus or minus standard error measure. In second place, adaptive scores across settings delayed. Third place, educational deficits. Fourth place, FSIQ and adaptive lower than 70. Fifth place, onset during the developmental period. Sixth place, FSIQ 70 and below in at least two adaptive domains, 70 and below. Next, we have a certain number of adaptive scales delayed. Um, interestingly, after that was at least two IQs below the expected range. Um, and then some people just go on IQ and there's even more options. So there's a whole lot of scatter in how we do this, which is why it's so great that we're talking about this tonight. And um, Scatter doesn't matter, right? right. Um, I'm going to have Eric introduce himself. OK. Hi, everyone. I'm Eric, and I'm a school psychologist in Connecticut. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Farmer, who, as Rachel mentioned, hasn't learned his lesson. So he's here for his third, uh, third podcast. And we are excited and delighted to have him back. Uh, doc, Dr. Farmer is an assistant professor with the school psychology program at Western Kentucky University. He also serves as the coordinator of the Educational and Behavioral Interventions Clinic. Prior to WKU, he was an intern and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Nebraska's Medical Center's Monroe Myers Institute. Dr. Farmer is a licensed psychologist in the Commonwealth of Kentucky and a board certified behavior analyst. His research is on evidence-based assessment, functional behavioral assessment, and dissemination of evidence-based practices. He has contributed book chapters to two volumes on the process of using cognitive assessment, including an in-press chapter on best practices in identifying intellectual disability. Recently, he was selected to participate in the School Psychology Research Collaboration Conference sponsored by the Society for the Study of School Psychology as an Early Career Scholar. So welcome, Dr. Farmer, and we'll take it away. <laughs> Thank you. I, I apologize, Eric. I didn't realize that was so... Um... Well, a little bit embarrassing, but ah. um, sorry about that. No, no worries. It was good. <laughs> well, um, so I guess we are here to talk about intellectual disability. Um, and I, I think I want to put a little bit of a spin on it and, and say that there's not a lot we need to talk about, right? Intellectual disability, it's been around for a while. It's probably the one it's probably the classification that most of us have down. It's a little, it's the most straightforward, right? Um, there's no waging wars back and forth about, you know, how we interpret the test. It's, it's just, you know, it's just ID. We can all handle ID. Um, certainly, our our poll made me um, very happy. I was very, very thrilled to see so many people uh, uh, fill that out, and I was also very thrilled to to see the answers. Um, the answers are going to line up largely with, with what I'm talking about tonight. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you all. So I think that you have a PowerPoint. Do you want us to, do you want to start us off with that or do you want us to? Sure, I can do that. 
Here, let's go ahead and jump there. So we'll we'll move through this pretty quickly. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here, but I just I do want to talk a little bit about some of the foundations of ID. So when it comes to ID, understanding it and understanding how it's developed and understood and all the research, the organization you need to know is the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. And in 2010, they uh, offered this definition. I'm not going to read it to you, that seems silly. Um, but you know, what, what I wanna point your attention to in this definition is that the majority of this definition isn't talking about an IQ test. The majority of this definition is talking about adaptive tests. And they're, they're concerned about those three areas, right? Conceptual, social, practical. Um, but but th that was a big shift in 2010 where we started saying, well, you know, IQ is useful, sure, but let's really think about those adaptive scores. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think there's some reason for that, right? So there's lots of variability in how intellectual disability can present. For instance, um, before we came on, we were talking a little bit about, you know, uh, emotional and behavioral problems that co-occur with ID. Well, that happens quite a bit but not always, right? We can have behavioral excesses like aggression. We can have behavioral excesses like, um, disruptive behavior and so forth. You can have also behavioral deficits, gross motor skills, academic skill deficits, et cetera. Just because we under, just because we can read an IQ doesn't mean that we understand what's going on with this kid or what this kid needs. And that I think, is the large or a, a large part of the reason that we saw AAIDD shift their focus to adaptive behavior. It allowed us to try to better understand what was actually going on for these kids. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that, but let's talk about these kids. How, how many kids are there is an important question, right? So approximately 1.84% of kids, children and adolescents are diagnosed with ID about 1.13 million people below the age of 18. And 7% of kids served under IDEA are served with ID as their classification. Now, I kind of want to point out, um, we've been seeing this number steadily decrease since 1975. I want to be really, really, really clear here. I don't think this means that we've seen a decrease in the number of people with ID. I think this means we've seen an increase in the number of people who are being diagnosed with other disorders. Uh, specific learning disability, for instance, was introduced in 1975. Certainly, we've seen more awareness of autism spectrum disorder and other related disorders in, in those years as well. So a lot of the kids who previously would have been diagnosed as ID are getting shifted over into other categories. And I think that's, well, it's actually not my opinion. It's other people's opinion that that's why we've seen this decrease in, um, in ID rates for IDEA. I see how many acronyms I can use in a single sentence. What do you guys think? We like our acronyms. <laughs> we do love our acronyms. We really do. We're great. All right, I just want to see how many acronyms I can get ID into. Let's see, let's see what I can do. All right. Um, well, first, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there. Is anyone at all surprised by the rates I'm talking about here, by the uh, numbers? Um. Well, I'm just looking it over again. <laughs> there are no children identified under. You prefer this one or the lovely little infogram infograph? No, I think that that makes sense. I mean, when you think about the bell curve and where 70 is going to be falling, correct? Yeah. 2%, yeah. Right. That's pretty good. Around there. It's it's slightly above what will be estimated if we used a purely uh, normative uh, curve. Because remember, it, it can't, it's not just on an IQ. It's on IQ and adaptive. So the probability of having both really low would actually be really, really, a really, really tiny tip of that curve. Mm -hmm. um, but because, well, it used to be that they would estimate prevalence that way based on um, people who would meet criteria and the percentages of the normal curve that would meet both. Um, and they found that that's 
actually a really low estimate. And so the, these estimates are a little more accurate. Um, etiology is always a fun topic with intellectual disability. It's always, you know, we can, we can create and we can generate a list of potential causes and, and, you know, uh, pre-existing uh, issues, but we, it's, it's really difficult to, to actually answer the question of where did this come from? Um, in general, there's, there are two broad camps. There's uh, biological, biological or cultural familial. Um, more recently, that's been thought of as either being genetic or acquired intellectual disability, um, sort of thinking about it more simply. But overall, what we, what we need to know is that we need to be considering a multifactorial approach. So we need to be considering, love those big words, right? We need to be thinking about the environment, the timing of the onset, and the initial cause, and the, the most likely cause of the disorder. And those pieces of information can actually fit together quite well and help you recognize um, where services might be necessary early on. For instance, um, genetic testing might be a necessity mm -hmm. if it were not an acquired, um, not an acquired intellectual disability, just as an example, um, uh, and so on and so forth. I could go on for far too long on that, and I would rather, I think that's probably outside the scope of what we're talking about here tonight. So. Mm -hmm. But the takeaway that I think what I want, I want you guys to leave with, what I want to leave having said tonight is we don't do a good enough job sometimes taking a good medical history, right? Sometimes we can't get at those cultural familial risk factors, or sometimes we think about only the school-based risk factors or the more current risk factors. Um, but having a good medical history, a good um, collaboration with a primary care physician uh, and a good understanding of the environment that surrounds the child during not just current, but also through their development are all really crucial components of a good intellectual disability assessment. Having, having that wraparound knowledge to support your conclusions is crucial. And, you know, I, you've, I'm sure that you guys and some other, some of listeners perhaps have seen me on the forums. I tend to not care so much about the diagnosis. I tend to not care about what does the date, what does, what, what <laughs> etiology or, or psychopathology are we talking about? I want to know how this leads to treatment. And this is the kind of information that can help us get to treatment. Mm. Um, last couple pieces of this, and then I'd like to kind of jump back into conversation, but because I think this is where it gets interesting, right? What are the key elements of, of intellectual disability diagnosis and classification? Um, in general, we want our IQ to be about two standard deviations below the mean. You know, this is that portion of the bell curve that we're talking about. This is what we're looking at. But you'll notice that my square is not drawn on that 70 line. I have a little bit of wiggle room above that. There's a good reason for it, right? We know that our tests are not amazingly accurate. Right. They right. do a good job. They do, I don't want to knock intelligence tests. They do a great job, but they're not perfect. And we need to be acknowledging that. So this is what we're talking about. When I, when I, when I say IQ, um, you know, two or uh, approximately two or less standard deviations below the mean, I'm talking about with some wiggle room, right? So that, that very top answer, 70 plus or minus the standard error of measurement, that just makes me happy because that's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are some things I'm gonna say that you know not everyone's gonna agree with and that's okay. Um, certainly I tend to push for a focus on general composites. So I'm gonna look at that FSIQ. I'm going to look at that GIA. Uh, I'm going to look at the, um, and so so on. I'm going to look at the FCI or whatnot. Those are the ones I'm going to focus on. I'm not going to care so much about the profile underneath that. And the reason I'm not going to care about that profile is that when we've looked at 
the sensitivity and specificity of those profiles in the past for predicting intellectual disability, they don't do a good job. They do a really poor job of it, actually. So it's, it's something that is um, not always, uh, people are not always happy to hear that, but it's true. They sim there's simply not any good data to back up the use of profiles in intellectual disability assessment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, ruling out construct irrelevant influences. I feel like we, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the word I feel like. I, I feel like we don't do a good job of that sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So can you so give us an example, example of what that might be? Yeah, so construct relevant influences, oh, they're all over the place. Um, <laughs> um, so there are just a ton, I, and we actually just wrote a ton on this. Um, but construct relevant influences are anything that would interfere with the ability of the test to measure what you're trying to measure. So, you know, I, I love this argument. You know, I think that the difference between the FRI and the VSCI is really useful. Um, we, we think that they're really useful because they're an ELL student. Mm -hmm. I was recently told this by mm -hmm. a practitioner and I said, well, can I ask you a question? And they said, sure. And I said, why did you give them that intelligence test to begin with? You knew there were an ELL, ELL student going in. All you did was introduce construct relevant influence and make your testing invalid. Mm -hmm. That's, that seems like a silly thing to me. Mm -hmm. I was looking at, sorry, I think. Yeah, that, um, yeah that, um, I try yeah. and do, pick out a test that will be, that the kid, will be, yeah, the least bias towards the kid and the circumstances that the child's in. Um, the, the, the test that I feel like they have the best chance of, of doing well on. Like, I'm rooted for the kid, I feel, I guess. I don't, <laughs> if that makes sense. No, it makes, I mean, that makes perfect yeah. sense. An IQ test is supposed to get the best cognitive performance estimate we can get, right? We want to see them succeed in that. And I think by making sure we're choosing a test that doesn't unnecessarily cause them to struggle, mm -hmm. then that is, a, I feel like that's just a necessity of the job, really, right? You would you would never give, oh gosh, the KBC to a child who had poor visual acuity, right? That just, that's just cruel. Um, you know, here, watch Rover jump. Where is Rover jumping? I don't know. Like, that seems like a, an, a, a crazy thing to do. Um, no, I absolutely agree. You have to give a, a test that is appropriate for the individual you're giving it to. And that doesn't mean having a standard battery. That makes sense. Ryan, I like what you, you alluded to also um, really interpreting at the, um, the, the test level, the whole test level, the FSIQ level, rather than getting bogged down at the index level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because globally we're looking at deficits in intellectual functioning and then adaptive and real world functioning. So um, that that makes good sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, it was um, Bergeron and Floyd have done a couple of good articles on this. And then Floyd and I are actually presenting this at the AAIDD conference in St. Louis in a couple of weeks. Um, but basically, Part scores just don't have good sensitivity and specificity. What they do is they, they increase, increase the likelihood that you're going to make a poor diagnostic decision. You know, that the question is, is interesting because I have, you know, I'm a parent of a child with an intellectual disability and um, it, who, who has some very good strengths in a couple areas, but um, you know, if we were to look at index scores or part scores, she does have a couple indices that are higher uh, than that 70 IQ, um, mm -hmm. though her, her full scale is lower. Um, so it, it, it uh, makes me think, you know, I wouldn't want someone to interpret uh, the indices uh, in a way that would um, 
disrupt the services that she's entitled to because of course adaptively she uh really really struggles so um so i you know it's important to me that uh we look at the fsiq and um not just the indices sure absolutely absolutely and that goes back to the whole like strength focus you know right. our kids can have you know our have tons of strengths but at the same time when we go back to the adaptives like those are the long-term lifelong needs that also require support kind of thing right. ryan could you could you tell us a little bit more about adaptives and what you think people should do with the adaptive rating space oh well adaptives unfortunately have not received the research attention that cognitives have they just haven't um this is unfortunate but it's true um, when we start talking about adaptive behavior, well, first of all, let me just say that for IQ, it's it's largely agreed upon across states. Not not completely, but it's it's pretty stable across states how we look at an IQ test, um, at least for ID. Mm -hmm. But when it when we look across states at how we're supposed to look at adaptive tests, there is literally no agreement. Mm -hmm. um, some states say you only look at that adaptive behavior composite, for instance, or the whatever composite score you have. Some states you need all three domains uh, below 70 or below. Some states say two domains. Some states say any domain. Some states say mm -hmm. composite score and one domain. It's really all over the place. And there's not a good scientific answer right now on which of these is the correct answer. And I think that's part of the reason it's a bit of a wild west out there in regard to adaptive behavior. That said, a lot of states have a lot of these rules because they're trying to respond to they're trying to respond to the AAIDD's new emphasis or or more focus on adaptive behavior. And I think that's a very appropriate thing to do in the light of all this. That said, you, you asked for, for my opinion on adaptive behavior, and I, I tend to look at that, that composite score, but, you know, I'm not bogged down by it. You know, I'm, I, I don't have a good answer as to which one is the best at this point in time. I wish I did. Um, however, um, I think one of the things I, 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 follow, I like to follow up with or think about are criterion mm. measures of adaptive ability. We as school psychologists tend to focus almost with blinders on norm reference measures, right? And I don't get me wrong, I love a good IQ test. I love a good adaptive test. They're, they're great, right? But do they really, are they always giving us the best information we can, we can get about a kid, right? So if we're talking about norm reference scores, that's awesome. We know generally where a person falls in, in reference to everyone else. But does that tell me exactly how to intervene right now? It might give us a ballpark to look in, but it doesn't actually tell us what to do next. We kind of have to figure that out through other, op through other means. Observation is probably the most common. Mm -hmm. I am an advocate, and I, I, I push this hard with my students, that they need to learn to administer criterion adaptive measures. Um, some examples are the... Um, VB map, the verbal behavior milestones and assessment pro protocol, et cetera, et cetera. And then the ABLES R, which is the assessment of basic learning and language, language and learning revised. I always get that backwards. Uh, those are just two examples of these criterion measures. And um, both of them do a really great job of telling you not just where a kid is, right? We're well beyond talking about where a kid is if we're doing criterion um, adaptive measure. What we're talking about at that point is what interventions, are, what's, what pivotal skills, what functional skills is this kid lacking? And can we develop interventions based on those pivotal skills to target those skills specifically? And I think that's a crucial step that we often miss in, in developing a package for these kids. We, we're so focused on the diagnosis, on that outcome, on that pathology that we miss the treatment side of it. And those criterion measures can really help push that. That is, that is awesome. awesome, thank you. <laughs> I, I have a question. Please. Um, um, is that, is that some, some like send the adaptive behavior home and some 
there's no validity measure on those rating scales. So like a parent could just circle two, 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 and it can be like so high. And then a teacher can, you know, respond completely differently. And we can have like a very awkward situation where we have like completely different data on a child who has a certain level of needs. So that's just like a really awkward situation that bothers me when it occurs, even though doing the phone interview with the adaptive behavior with a parent is extremely time consuming. It's a way to get like at actual skills their child can do. I just want to right. throw that out there. I, I know it's, I, <laughs> I, I love, I love multi-informant, right? We have to, it's a necessity. We have to understand how these deficits um, interact across settings and with different people and understanding those stimuli. It's a part of that piece I was talking about at the beginning, right? You have to understand the environment that surrounds the kid right now and developmentally. That's crucial. That said, those measures um, love to disagree with each other. It's actually part of their programming, I think. Yeah. Um, they, they, they just, <laughs> and it, it can be frustrating. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, there's just not enough good evidence out there to, to direct us in one way or another on how to respond to that. Um, I think that's one of the things we need to be pushing for um, in, in intellectual disability realm in particular, to try and understand when and how to deal with that. Sorry, I, I hope you weren't expecting me to have all the answers. Wow, uh, there uh, there aren't uh, enough answers, and like I love that you mentioned the V the V BAP enables or whatever. I, we don't have those, but I I love that those exist because to be more objective is hard, and it's good to have options. Yeah, the VP map. I was actually going to pull it up really quick. It's from Mark Sundberg, and it's the um, Verbal Behavior Milestones Assessment and Placement Program. It's typically used in um, applied behavior analysis settings. But the one that might be perhaps more appropriate for um, school psychologists is the ABLES R, which is the assessment of basic language and learning skills. And that one's from WPS. Um, but that one I, I like a lot because it actually focus on, focuses on some of those early language, academic, self-help and motor skills that we might more commonly associate with um, adaptive measures in general. And it tells us specifically, here's a skill that this kid doesn't have. Yeah says this is one they definitely don't have and then you can literally flip that straight into an outcome and once you have an outcome that's measurable and easy to follow then you can develop interventions to um, facilitate to facilitate it that's very cool i'd love to get my hands on that <laughs> sorry if we're looking a little bit far uh sidetracked here. I know that we're having some technical difficulties. So thank you for everyone who's been sticking with us and we're getting the correct link out. I know that there's 15 of you or so watching or 16 and some of you are kind of waiting and trying to log on and not having some. So there is a new link and we're trying to, that's why we're kind of troubleshooting a little bit, but <laughs> my apologies. I Rachel, did have, oh yeah, go ahead. You have a lot of ID experience across states. So I'm just dying to hear your thoughts. Oh, yeah. Um, so I've seen um, there's different criteria for sure in, in different states. It's mostly uh, pretty similar that, you know, deficits in IQ, um, deficits in adaptive behavior. Um, in North Carolina, it was 70 plus or minus the standard error of measurement where I'm in in North Carolina. Um, now I'm in Maryland and it's 70 plus or minus uh, five. Um, mm -hmm. And here there's, you know, you need two subscales that are two standard deviations are below, um, you know, so it's just a little bit different. Anytime I go to a new state, I'm like, okay, well, let me look up all your eligibility criteria because I know there's a couple differences here and there. Um, but IDs, you know, pretty, I was also, I wanted to comment that the poll I thought was interesting. I thought that there was going to be a lot of people because one of the options was, you know, having a flat profile. Um, and so I thought that a lot of people were going to be checking that just given conversations on the forum, but it didn't really get that much um, votes. And I know we have um, some comments on that. I think that um, Dr. McGrew is, is watching, so we're all like, oh, he's, he's watching. <laughs> um, and I was hoping to read that out now that I kind of looked on to, uh, went back to that topic of scatter. Yeah, um, so just to really briefly talk about the flat profiles thing, certainly we, we tend to see more flat profiles with children with ID than with SLD or, or whatnot, but um, you know, it's not a criteria. 
And I think if we start treating it as a criteria, what we're going to do is potentially deny someone access to services by creating more stringent criteria than our state or district policies, than the DSM, than the AAIDD have set forth. And I can understand that, that more research is needed to better understand that. I, I certainly would never disagree with that comment. But I, with where we are now, we know that with where we are now, the concern for requiring things like that it increases the difficulty to get the diagnosis. If you increase the difficulty to get the diagnosis, you potentially decrease the access to decrease the students' access to services. That, mm -hmm. to me, is a really big red flag. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm looking at uh, the question. So, what is the opinion? Uh, what is opinion regarding the use of part scores GCGF for the ID prong when the full state IQ is not a representative? This is suggested in AAIDD Death Penalty and Intellectual Disability 2015 publication. Um, so, again, so same thing. You feel that that it's not written in there, and so um, you know we're adding those extra criteria oh. when we should be. First, I would I would suggest that anyone who would like to learn more about scatter and cognitive tests go watch ryan mcgill's um episode of this very podcast it's uh mm -hmm. it's very evidence-based and that's a crucial component you know we've been looking at uh, scatter in intelligence tests for decades mm -hmm. it's been a, a pass down from instructor to student from former student to new student for a very long time. It's been in Sattler, it's in the new WISC-5 Essentials book, uh, it's, it appears in manuals. Um, unfortunately, I would ask you to find me one citation that supports it. Mm. That's, that's where I would end that. And if we're not being evidence-based, evidence then what are we doing and why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. Okay, Anna just figured out why we have a wrong link. Um, we went into the wrong, um, the wrong. Our title is off too, <laughs> because we're this is um, two weeks from now podcast. So my apologies, that was totally my bad. Um, hoping to get that. I uh, will switch the title because um, we're talking about ID, not stats tonight. Um, and I'm going to try and spread that link out right now. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I, I also uh, I retweeted and posted out there on YouTube and uh, I mean on Facebook and Twitter. So hopefully people are catching up. And I know we have one viewer who was just going to get back to writing reports anyway, but she caught us. So I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it applies the whole like measurements and, and what matters. <laughs> It all connects a little bit. And Rachel, I got to give you props because, um, like, I, none of us get paid for this, right? Like, this is just something we do out of the goodness of our heart. And we do it because you came up with the idea and you uh, make these events and, like, run the live stream and all that stuff. And, like, you're the best. So thank you. And this information is going out there, even if there's 15 people, like, logging in live instead of 25 or whatever. Thank yeah, we're up to 27 now. So thank you everybody right. who's coming in late. Um, you'll have to rewatch the first part. Right. That's totally my fault. That's <laughs> Sorry, awesome. Dr. Farmer. <laughs> oh, no worries. No worries. Okay. okay, I totally derailed this again. My apologies. Um, we were talking about um, the scatter. Um, let's see. Oh, um, I had a question too. Um, I'm not super familiar with some of the measures that measure adaptive behavior more directly um, as opposed to a rating scale. What are your thoughts on that? Is that something that we should look to start incorporating into evaluations, like a more standardized approach to adaptive behavior assessment? I, I, it, it, how, which tests a person selects depends on the question they're trying to ask, right? And so if the question we're trying to answer is, does this child have intellectual disability? then the norm rating scales are what we need, right? The normative scales are what we need. Uh, if, if our goal then is to develop a strong treatment plan for a student, then maybe we should be looking at some of those more direct measures of adaptive skills. For instance, like I, like I mentioned earlier, the, the ABLES is a good measure for that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to look into the ABLES a little bit more after this episode. <laughs> 
and <laughs> see if I can figure that out because that is like a common, you know, we want to, we want to do right by kids. And if we can do right by kids by going in one direction rather than going in another, then that would be, it'd be great. So thank you for that tip. Yeah. And I will say the, I will say those measures tend to be a bit long, but mm -hmm. um, they give you a lot of really powerful information. And I, I do think uh, when we do adaptive measures uh, as an interview, rather than just sending it home or sending it to the teacher, we get much more accurate responses. And I think it's worth the time uh, to sit with a parent, mm -hmm. you know, and sit with a teacher. Sometimes you get responses that, you know, the the entire, the, even the teacher or parent is is sort of shocked how they came out. And you sit with them and they say, oh, well, they can't do it independently, but you know, so we sort of have that confirmation bias or, you know, rose colored glasses kind of thing with, um, with those. So, you know, I, I said earlier, if you don't have data, you don't have a lot. Right. Um, you know, and there, there are some studies out there that say that the rating forms are just as valid, just as strong, et cetera. But I think, you, I think you're right. What, what, what those, what those, um, validity studies are potentially missing in this situation is the ability to follow up. The ability to treat it like a semi-structured interview and to get clarification, right? Uh, I remember giving the Sib R back in um, actually I don't remember what year, but I remember giving the Sib R, and one of the questions was about um, using the white pages, and you know this was probably at the very end of that test's uh, lifespan, where you know you could still justify having a conversation about white pages. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the number of parents who would sit there for a moment and go, is using Google count. And so they were able to use Google, but they couldn't use the white pages. So they got a really low score on that. So if they were just filling out a, like, a, you know, a rating scale, one, two, three, or whatnot, they would have gotten a zero. But having that conversation and realizing, you know, maybe this test Let's let's interpret this item a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, yeah, I think I think you have some a very valid point there. So, um, in connecting kids with services, uh, typically, kids become adults with intellectual disabilities, and that's one of the things where, similar to autism, you know, it's something that can be pervasive, lifelong. You expect that they will need support, so that's another reason we want to really do right by kids and look into it thoroughly um, because it matters not just for this like one hour awkward CSE meeting or you know whatever I don't know about you guys but I've made some parents cry mm -hmm. and like you know it's so hard and awkward and uncomfortable and sometimes occasionally not but you know like to tell a parents like this is where they're at and that's what it is. So uh, anyone have any, you know, there's not, there's nothing easy about that conversation. Yeah. And I agree, you know, we need to be mindful of the fact that for us, yeah, this is one hour, uh, mm -hmm. maybe, you know, a couple of hours with testing and assessment and all that. But in the long run, what we do in that one hour and those couple of hours sets a student up to either be successful or not. And we need to acknowledge the the power of that, the importance of that. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned about you know appropriately categorizing so that um, students get services. I work in elementary, so I um, currently, and so I don't have a whole lot of experience with you know transitioning um, students, you know, um, beyond school age type of thing. So is that what the biggest concern is that services kind of down the line because we know that within the schools you know eligibility should not drive what what they're getting on their IEP need drives what they're getting on IEP so is it the, the concern is for services after school I'm gonna make two points um, the first point is I am not a transition specialist it's not my area so I can't speak towards that a ton um, the second I will say is you're right um, diagnosis should not drive services, need should drive services. And that's why I'm saying that, you know, when we can, when we walk out of a meeting going, yep, that was a clear case of intellectual disability, great, let's do BLOC, which is our standard course of care for a child with intellectual disabilities, right? Whatever that may be called in your respective districts. Well, 
I just said to you guys at the very beginning of this that the presentation of ID can look very different from child to child. And so without doing that more in-depth follow-up, without really looking at what the kid is doing in, the, in a day-to-day -day situation, which adaptive skills that kid is lacking, um, how do we know that that standard course of care is what that kid needs? Right? We can talk about needs-based services all day, but when we have standard operating procedures for interventions, it's really hard to justify that as being anything more than a buzzword. Mm -hmm. That was my um, soapboxy moment of the podcast, I think. Uh, that, that was good. And you know what? Um, I we, we consult where I work with a psychiatrist once a month. And, um, and he's always like, so is this kid mild, moderate, or severe? Like, where does this kid fall? And that's something that I don't think I had a lot of, like, training on in grad school, like how to classify how intellectually disabled a child is kind of a thing. And so that's something, what about you guys? Like, is that something you're familiar with that you would write in a report or what? Um, I think I kind of learned, yeah, not so much in grad school, but in on, on the job. And I typically don't write it in the report. Um, I just look at, you know, do they meet criteria for ID? But I don't know. Sure. Really. Same here. You know, to me, that's kind of, I, I don't know if I would call it old school back mm -hmm. 25 years ago or something. Yeah. Had, at least um, in Pennsylvania and then New York, we had um, uh, educably mentally retarded was a category and then uh, severe and profound was a category. So uh, depending on the IQ cutoff, um, kids were typically placed in a uh, more structured self-contained kind of program um that certainly changed uh over the years but that was initially how i was trained that you know if it was i, I can't remember but maybe 60 to 70 or 55 to 70 was emr um uh yeah. below that was what they called trainable and then i think mm -hmm. below 45 was uh spmr uh severe and profound uh, um but i you know the, the Current, um, you know, uh, information that Ryan shared changed. At least from what I would do in, in schools, I would look at it as just um, ID or or not ID. Right. And yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. It sounds like you were saying like it's about the needs and their skills in the moment that we should be addressing. Mm -hmm. So that's like the short term issue. It is. Um, certainly, this is another one of those areas where there's not been an adequate amount of research and what has been researched has not been shared well. Um, Luckison has done quite a bit of work in that area, um, but I, I, it's not, I don't, I don't feel comfortable trying to relay the massive amount of work he's done in this, uh, in this window just because I'm not as up to date on it. That said, what I will do is I, I will, first of all, agree with Eric. You know, I was taught you, you got to use a GAC, you got to, um, you know, figure out their adaptive level based on some largely, largely, um, largely based on clinical judgment, really. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, where do you think this kid falls on a scale of zero to 100? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was taught to do when I, when we went through. And then not very long after, maybe a couple years after, the DSM-5 changed and shifted it from ID to, let's talk about um, the adaptive scores. And so, you know, if you look in the DSM-5 now, they actually provide these tables for what um, what mild looks like across each of the domains. So for instance, um, let's look at the social domain, mainly because it's shorter, uh, mild. Um, compared to typically developing age makes the individuals immature in social interactions. For example, there may be difficulty in accurately perceiving peer social cues, communication, conversation, and language are more concrete or immature than expected for age. And again, it's still largely subjective, but they're trying to provide some behavioral anchors to tie it to. And they actually provide these for uh, mild, moderate, and uh, and severe, of course. Awesome. And profound, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So those are those are a couple of things. I. It's hard to go into and say, this is what it should be based on this information. What we should be talking about are the level of supports needed for this individual. Mm -hmm. 
Does this individual need a one-to-one -one aid? Do, are they going to be fine in a general education classroom? It's it's hard to it's hard to give a rule of thumb on that right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a comment from the um, the chat, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Um, someone has a foster child who's very street smart but struggles everywhere else. In that, it sounds like that was a Rebecca. You're you're in on the chat better than I am. A harder time for that person to yes. identify. That was a the, um, a comment in addition to somebody else who had said um, uh, one of the tricky situations that I ran into before that I have run into before is that when we get the adaptive living skills rating back from the parents to be low average or below average, everything else was it was within the MI range, and so. Um, uh, another viewer commented that she had that same situation with a foster child. Um, some suggest that it is okay to propose eligibility for MI even when the adaptive living skills are not consistent across settings. So he, he doesn't feel comfortable with that. Yeah, and again, like I said, you know, unfortunately one of the things we haven't put enough emphasis on is trying to understand these cross-setting or, or contextual impairments. We don't really know, like there is no hard and fast answer here. I wish there were. Um, as it comes to street smarts, I, again, I would direct you to, to the question you're trying to ask, right? Are, you're, the question you're asking is, does this individual have intellectual disability? And as part of that, you're asking, what is this individual's intellectual functioning? What is this individual's adaptive functioning? If, if you're if if you're asking something beyond those questions, you're no longer asking about ID. Really trying to keep it narrow and focused is important going in. So there's another comment about um, maybe using multiple measures, like two different teachers instead of the parent, if the parent isn't engaged or you know what I mean, like viewing the child in the same way. I think that sounds awesome. What do you think, Ryan? If it's about what the kid needs at school, two people from school completing different rating scales. It depends on the age and the nature of the of the um, of the of the case, right? So, mm -hmm. if you're looking at a kid who is in general education and in special education, and you're trying to get information from each of those professionals, then that's great. If you're looking at a high school kid who's across multiple classrooms, I can see that being justified. If you're looking at an elementary school teacher and you're getting one elementary school teacher and another elementary school teacher who happens to be in the same classroom uh, mm -hmm. in co-taught classes, for instance, that's probably not necessary. So when we're talking about, because um, I know the DSM requires the across two settings, the state mm -hmm. that I'm in right now, um, from my understanding, it, that's not specified as far as the across um, two settings. So I feel like like almost if I am indicating ID, like I don't, I can kind of, um, I have more wiggle room, like I can rely upon the teachers. If everybody's seeing, you know, everything's lining up with ID and all my observations and the teacher's adaptives and that all meshes together, I feel comfortable going with ID. If I was working under the DSM umbrella though, in private practice, would I need to be, a, would I be requiring that parent to also be in line? What, what is considered a setting, I guess is what I'm saying, per DSM standards? Is it, you know, math class and reading class? Is it school and home? Is it, um, you know, playground and in school? Like, what, what is a setting when we're talking about across yeah. two or more settings? Well, I think there are, there, there are a couple of things I want, I want to clarify here. Um, the across settings rule is not from the DSM. Okay. Um, the DSM has, has three criteria. Those criteria are below average intellectual functioning, below average adaptive functioning within the developmental age period. Okay. A lot of ID assessments can be done completely outside of the school district without ever contacting a teacher. And that would, con and that would constitute a medical diagnosis of intellectual disability. Some states do require it. I don't, I don't believe that IDEA requires it, but don't hold me to that. Um, actually, no, you can hold me to that. Hold on just a moment. I have a slide. What do you know? You're prepared. I admire your ability to multitask right now because I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the federal definition is um, 
significantly sub-average general intellectual functioning, existing concurrently with deficits in adaptive function, adaptive behavior, and manifested the, during the developmental period that adversely affects a child's educational performance. So, what I what I see there is the parent or the there is a, there is below average adaptive functioning. There's below average intellectual functioning, and they're uh, they're 18 or younger, or it occurred at, at least for the first time while they were 18 or younger. And then that educational performance piece is their grades are suffering as a result of it, right? And that's just a standard boilerplate requirement of all educational classifications. Mm -hmm. I think. Even though this is one of our go-tos, one of our, oh, we've got that nailed down, there's still a lot of questions, a lot of ambiguity about what is it and how do we do it? How do we do it well? Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of want to comment on that for a second because this is one of the things that um, drives me the craziest. If you were to go to a hospital in Nashville, uh, in, in Tennessee, and then they diagnosed you with um, leukemia, and you drove an hour north into Kentucky, and then they said, well, you don't actually meet our criteria for leukemia, so we're not going to treat you. Would we accept that? Would anyone accept that? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, intellectual disability and other, other psychological and behavioral disorders are, are different in, in, the, in, their, um, in their severity, but we should be holding them to the same standard of if it's a disorder, it's a disorder, and it warrants being treated. Mm -hmm. This this in, this jigsaw approach to policy and definitions of pathology are just is just insane. And I realize that's not something that we have a ton of influence over. Um, we're kind of subject to it, but I, it's just the the fact that you can you can drive five minutes across a district line and be told no, that's no, that no longer counts. Mm -hmm. boggles my mind is completely unjust and it should be something that we as practitioners as researchers as national organizations should be fighting against mm -hmm. yeah that's well it said is, yeah it yeah. is crazy and i have a hard time explaining it to parents when they come in with an iep and you're like ah well it's healthy there but we have to look at it differently <laughs> we have to <laughs> it's mind-boggling and i you know that's easily my 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 biggest uh complaint about mm -hmm. how all this is set up well i'm i'm admiring that um yeah. eric rachel and rebecca are, are all three of them are on a committee through nasp so we've got like national connections right now so i'm feeling <laughs> right. inspired through your involvement on the national level <laughs> that you know eventually with some an, an enough sharing of information things could become a little bit more even. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would yeah. settle for clarity. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, I want to uh, maybe just add, uh, you know, for the, the comments that people were sort of making uh, on the YouTube, just about talking to parents. It looked like some people, you know, we have a box of tissues in our conference room and, um, you know, it, it's such a hard thing. And, and as a parent with a child who has special needs, um, it, you know, School psychologists are some of the most compassionate and kind and supportive people that I've ever met. And so keep, you know, keep doing it the way you're doing it, you know, with the tissues and the love and the hug. Um, it's not easy, uh, but just letting those parents know you're going to do your best to support them and, and just being there for them and with them and, uh, and loving their kids um, makes all the difference in the world. And um, so I would just you know, encourage those of us who it's always nerve wracking, even with my own, you know, I have my own child. But when I go into those conversations with parents, uh, I'm nervous and I feel for them. And um, so just continue doing, you know, having that approach that that um, that we have. Uh, it makes all the world a difference. Eric, I could not have said it better. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. The only thing I tend to add, aside from just genuinely being kind and supportive in those situations is you know, the diagnosis doesn't tell us what's happening next. What happens next is getting some of those supports in place and seeing how they respond to them. And as long as they're responding to them, we're going to keep doing it. And I think that knowing, a parent simply knowing that, that you're there to provide that is a huge, huge service. Yeah, absolutely. I attended a CSE this year where a 
different psychologist was presenting and um, they were saying like, I hate to read like your child has a 52 IQ because your child, you know, they said their name is so much more than this, mm -hmm. you know, and they went on about their strengths and I'm like, yes, I know this child. I work with this child. This child's amazing. You know what I mean? Like just keeping strength focused. Those of you out there who have to do this because like the needs, yes. And the strengths, boom, that's yeah. what matters. Yeah. Not so the number. Such a good message. And that's, I know we're wrapping up, but I, another question just popped into my head. Um, I've been in such some situations where I've explained, you know, the 52 IQ is generally in as comp with as much, you know, compassion as I'm mm -hmm. able to convey that. But that I feel like at the end of the meeting that the parent doesn't really understand because I'll get questions like, well, you know, when will they grow out of this? Or, um, you know, when are they going to be able to do this thing over here, which seems unrealistic now. Um, and so I've heard some people suggest that we use, I know we use intellectual disability now and the former and inappropriate term is mental retardation. I've had some people suggest, well, you know, maybe you should say to these parents, you know, this is intellectual disability is what is formally known as MR. Yep. And I get really uncomfortable about that. Do you have an opinion on that? Like, is that something that we should be stepping into if we feel yeah. it? I, I, here's the thing. If you tell me a kid has ID, even if you spit out some magic IQ number, and you know, they, they are generated mostly through magic and fairies. Um, <laughs> then at the end of the day, what, what I know is that your test told me this number, right? The absolute best predictor of where that kid's going to be in 10, 15, 20 years is how well they respond to the interventions we put in place over the next six months to a year. Mm -hmm. And that is how I tend to respond to parents when they ask those questions. And it sounds something like, um, gosh, I'm putting myself on the spot. Um, it sounds something like, you know, I, I can't answer that question for you. I honestly can't. I wish I could. I wish I had a, a crystal ball I could look into and tell you the answers to all these questions. The best I can do is help you to put the best interventions in place that we can. And then we'll see how he responds to those interventions. And that'll be our best indicator of the future. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I think we have one more quick question. I think we can fit it in. <laughs> um, should we assume that adaptive skills across uh, settings, especially at the elementary level, home versus school, are just different settings, even if it is within school? I, I guess if we have to talk about settings. Yeah. So here's, here's, I'll try and keep this short. Remember that you're not measuring the same thing with a home-based, with a parent adaptive measure and a school-based adaptive measure. What you're measuring is the kid's day-to-day -day functioning at home mm -hmm. with parent level supports and the kid's day-to-day -day functioning at school with teacher level supports and 20 other kids in the classroom, mm -hmm. right? And so it's likely that a teacher is gonna see more deficits than a parent because one, their frame of reference is larger. Mm -hmm. Two, they're not able to provide as much one-on-one -on -one assistance. And three, gosh, as parents, we just want to help our kids, right? And so sometimes we're facilitating things and making things easier. And to us, that's normal, right? That's, that's exactly what we should be doing. So it's not a question of can they not do it? It's, well, I don't require them to do that. That's fine. Mm -hmm. It's not an issue. And so we have to, and I keep coming back to that one of the first things I said, right? is we have to be knowledgeable and, and we have to acknowledge the context in which these behaviors are occurring. Without that knowledge, without that context, we're shooting in the dark. And so that's where I come back to what Eric said earlier, right? The semi-structured nature of the interview for adaptive tests is really powerful because you can say, oh, it's so awesome that he can do that, knowing already in the back of your head that the teacher has told you that they can't, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how much support do they need when they're doing that? Right. And now you have a lot more context. You have a lot more background. You have a better understanding of the environment. And guess what? You might also have a good idea about what kind of intervention or supports they might need in the school. Because you're seeing how they're successful at home. That's the best answer I can give there because, I, I you know, there's just not, not enough out there to, to give a definitive on this one. Gotcha. 
Okay, thank you so much for coming. And again, I apologize for all the technical difficulties and thank you for the bunch of you who are still watching and signed on. And um, I'm gonna fix those links and we will try to um, not have that happen again, so. <laughs> Good life. All right. But this um, was seriously awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, night. <laughs> night.